So today is Saturday, October 6, 2018, and this is episode 226 of the Defensive Security Podcast, a recording from the lovely Derby Con in Louisville, Kentucky, along with uh, Mr. Andy Callett. Hello, Jerry. How are you? Never better. And we have a, a live studio audience. It's a, it's a much smaller live studio audience than normal, right? So, Well, we're on the road. Correct, right. We yeah. don't have the stadium with us. So. That's true. And, you know, security is a lot tougher to bring on the road with us, so we've got a vet who comes in. Co- right. You know, it's, just, it's complicated. E- exactly. It's complicated. Exactly. So um, just, uh, just before we get started, the uh, the thoughts and opinions we express on the show are ours and do not represent those of our employer. Um, so so uh, joining us uh, are a couple of uh, <laughs> couple of people. Um, who are here at DerbyCon with us. Uh, first up is... Hi, this is Carolina Espinoza. And? John Carr. So, um, so yes, w- w- I just wanted to take just a couple of, couple of minutes at the start and uh, get your feedback on the conference. So, Carolina, what do you, what do you think? Um, oh, yes. Uh, I'm enjoying the conference. Um, the um, scene... Uh, Faces that I haven't seen in a while, like from Gurkhan or from B-Sides Las Vegas. Also uh, meeting new people either in Lobby Con or Hallway Con. And um, I'm mean, just enjoying the variety of talks. You, it's very difficult to choose what to go, you so know, have listen you, to. Have you learned anything? Uh, oh, is that part of it? Yeah, oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> you, you probably learned not to come to Jerry's room. <laughs> yes. Likely. Yes, I learned the secret knock. <laughs> no, right now I'm focusing on some of the talks that deal with um, uh, WMI exploitation and PowerShell. So my concern is me being blue team security analysts. I want to know how to lock down my network and reduce the risk. So have you have you picked up anything that is worth sharing? Um, yes. Um, n- not about that. Actually, about social engineering. Okay. Um, what did you learn? Well, in the social engineering yesterday, um, I was listening to listening on two calls. And I realized how easy it is uh, for um, to get the person on the other end of the line to do things. To if you have the right voice, the right tone, um, and and you're able to um, make it sound like, oh, I didn't mean to bother you. I just got to get this done. Kind of like uh, create some kind of bonding, you know, with the with the person on the other line, and the person or persons were able to give away information. And I didn't know that there's points or there's points given for everything that can be given away. But what really got me was how easy it was to convince a person to go to a specific website and read off the information on the website. So um, they were directing the persons to go to bit.ly slash and then a specific uh, website. So... And I'm, for me, my concern is uh, just to remind users, do some security awareness, to remind them not to click on links, not to enumerate what it is that they have, the software or hardware. If they get any calls like that, I'll just say, I'm busy and hang up. So this was during the social engineering uh, contest yes. here at the conference tonight. Good. And so how about you, John? Uh, let's see. I learned that I'm getting older and can't stay out as late as I used to. That's one big thing. As I, we all are, yes. <laughs> yeah. I also learned that hydration is important. Um, no, this this year, it's so... I, I'm really liking where DerbyCon's going this year. They open up more tickets. Um, so they had, And they also have a new uh, venue, which I'm kind of liking also. Um, the interesting part, and we were talking about this a little bit off mic a little bit earlier, is that we're seeing a lot of faces we haven't seen, a lot of faces that we normally would see we're not seeing. So I think actually... Our experience might be a little bit different, um, but I know at the last session I was at about an hour and a half ago, they had everyone raise their hand asking, "So, who here is your for your very first DerbyCon?" And half the hands went up. So it is a it's a it's a bigger crowd and a lot of folks who've never been here before. So that that's the thing that surprised me, which I kind of like actually, just some new blood. Uh, I think overall, it's talks wise, 
um, feels like there's a, like you had mentioned, there's a lot of conversations happening this time around about social engineering, which obviously we all know because the defenders are getting better. So now the bad guys are switching now to hacking the human. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm seeing finally kind of change and kind of roll over a little bit. It's a lot more conversations about cloud. Um, which we haven't seen as many, but I think now most companies are dabbling enough in it, especially in the Fortune 500 now, that we're seeing some people talking about post-exploitation techniques and lateral movement within cloud, which we've not seen a lot of those talks in the past. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, the the one, uh, I guess one observation I had is that um, there's a lot of, lot of, it's kind of back to a lot of red team type talks. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. Yeah, not a lot of like heavy blue team this time. Right. So so um, so Jason, J- this is uh, this is Jason Bell. Um, he's up here from uh, from university. So give me your impressions, Jason. Also known as your son. Yeah yeah yeah. Well, hopefully that was obvious. But okay. So yeah, um, I'm enjoying it. I'm not really any into any of this at all. Um, <laughs> however, just from an outsider standpoint, looking in the. Uh, fullness of a lot of the talk rooms is giving me the impression that a lot of um, what the speakers have to talk about are important in the current atmosphere of the industry and in the sense that they need to be elaborated on either more it was an interesting so so it's an interesting top or interesting point I've noticed a couple things about this show one is the talks seem to be either super full or or not at all, right? I'm expecting not at all for mine tomorrow. <laughs> well, it's a bad... we'll, we'll do everything we can to make sure it's not as full. There's an expectation that something's going to happen, so I, I've heard. Yeah. I yeah. mean, this show probably won't be published until that's all, you know, water under the bridge. But... Right, right. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's, it, it is kind of interesting to see the things that draw the people in, and, uh, and, and those that don't, which... You know, I, I, it, it makes me wonder. You know, did, did the conference planners or the the speaker, uh, or sorry, the um, you know, like the CFP reviewers have a have an idea of which ones are going to be that popular and not when they're actually selecting it? I, and I don't have any idea. I just well, it's an interesting challenge that I think conference organizers have to have to manage, which the tickets are open to anybody as they should be, right? So they don't really know who's going to show up. Right. Necessarily, they don't really know what level in the industry they're at, what their interests are, uh, what level of expertise they may have. So they kind of have to make some best guesses of running the gambit of, you know, everybody from new entrants to the industry to folks who've been doing it for twenty years, red team, blue team, purple team, compliance, um, or, or just kind of pick a pick a cultural focus mm-hmm. for a conference. I think that gets a little interesting, and, and it's tough to predict. But um, yeah, I think I think most of the talks I've seen have certainly been interesting, and, and the, the the topic ranges of talks have been pretty varied, for sure. I wouldn't yeah. mind seeing too, an, like somewhere to someone to do a little bit of work to see the intersection between who, like the personality, the person doing the talk, versus how many people are showing up. Because I'm sure, I mean, in the past, people have talked about this has made its rounds on Twitter's for years and years about. The, about the echo chamber of the security community, and there are certain people that you know there are they're known. They're the Ed Scotuses. They're the Leslie Carhartts. That you know, you know that no matter what they're talking about, they could be reading the dictionary. Nice people are going to show up. Good job. Yeah. Well, no, I, no, I, I don't. I have. She, I don't know. I don't know her, and she doesn't know me. But I. But I mean, that's. But that's kind of the point I'm making. That she, so there are certain people that have a name in the industry that they could show up and talk about anything, and people are going to show up. So I'm wondering for those yeah. ones that are good, heavy technical topics, but people don't know them. I don't know necessarily if they're going to get the turnout right away. So well, I know that's that. A great this, point. Yeah, but this this particular con does a blind CFP, uh, which is, I think, a general good. But it's interesting because they're they're picking talks based purely on the the out the abstract or the outline of the content, um, and not necessarily on the skill set of the presenter as a presenter. Hmm. And yeah. you know, I think I don't know a better way to do it. By the way, uh, I'm not saying we should do it any other way, but uh, I think you can get some folks who are amazing presenters uh, present an interesting and entertaining talk on a, on, a, on a lame subject and vice versa, right? You could have somebody who's an amazing uh, topic but not a very good presenter, and you know, these are two different skill sets we're trying to find the intersection of. 
Yeah. So anyway, that's just my two cents. Indeed. And so, uh, so tomorrow, on on the, the last day, you are you are giving a talk. I am. I'm at. Uh, well, I'm sure nobody will hear us before it happens. But two p.m. Sunday, on uh, you know, kind of shifting our mindset to from technical to psychological defenses, and it's a very updated version of the talk I gave in Bogota earlier this year. Uh, and I was very happy to be selected. So the only challenge is that it's the last slot on the last day. So I'm hoping folks are still here because a lot of folks leave early on Sunday. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. So uh, so thank you to everyone who is uh, here in the room with us. And well, now, I also want to point out oh, that, yeah, yeah. that you're not actually I, I am not speaking. That's correct. And, and just so everyone is aware, mm-hmm. uh, Mr. Callett has a speaker badge, and I do not. And I have... Um, I've heard about this, I don't know, maybe 30 times so far. Today. Uh, today, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, it's early yet. It is. Yeah, so. Carry on. Anyway. So, so moving on, um, we're going to talk about our, um, our stories now. And first, first up is a story from Tripwire, and the title here is BEC as a service offers hacked business accounts for as little as $150. Which, you know, in some ways is probably quicker and easier than trying to, you know, get a new account provision with my own company. Well, that's a good point, right? I mean, it could be it could be economical, right? It's kind for, of like, for for new hires. It's kind of like a cloud service. Right. Just saying. Here you go. IAM, you managed IAM, right? Um, so, so the you know, it's a, it's a it's an interesting article that ties in a, a bunch of different data points, but one of the you know one of the most uh, interesting aspects is was uh, you know highlighted in the in the title of the article here is the fact that there's a um, there's an, an economy growing up around business email compromise and so the point is you know if you have a if you have a need to get into a target get into a a victim company you know you don't you don't necessarily have to go through all the dirty work to compromise them yourself i mean it's almost like mechanical turk for bad guys right you you know it's some someone uh someone will go do the you know and it's not by the way fundamentally different than the um you know, like the exploit kit economy that's that's grown up. Um, well, it's very results oriented. Correct. It's on demand. It's on demand, and and you and it's pay for results. It's part of the gig economy. <laughs> Just saying. You, 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 I can't argue with that. So, so the idea being basically, I can contract with one of these services. Say, I need an email account in company X Y Z. Right. And uh, pay them upon delivery. Correct, and 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 so as we've talked about in the past, um, one of the one of the big challenges with uh, with business email compromise, and you know, by the way, that like there's um there's a couple of reasons why an adversary may want an, an account. One is they want to retrieve the information that's in an email account. Another one might be that they want to, you know, they want to use that account, as we've seen in a lot of um, you know financial fraud. Uh, business email con- uh, compromise cases. You know they want to they want to compromise the CEO's email account and then send a um, you know an email requesting funds to purchase a customer or uh, a company um, to the CFO and and that ends up you know poc- pocketing the the bad guys a whole bunch of money um, and, and and probably many other uh, things in between. And and I would say when you when you start thinking about um, you know this this particular scenario. It becomes difficult to defend against because a lot of the traditional stuff, like you know, maybe marking the subject line as the you know having the email coming from an outside source, doesn't really work because it's a. It, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it is the CEO. It, it's it's the CEO's account who has sent the email. Yeah, it could be digitally signed. Right, because that happens automatically internally. It, it, a lot of the trust is already there implicitly. Correct, and so so that says that, you know, it, it especially around certain key processes, like for instance fund transfers and, and things like that that are, um, you know, both susceptible and targeted. 
uh, by the bad guys, you know, really makes sense to develop a process. You know, like maybe you have to verbally confirm. You know, and and you know, and by the way, that, that's not even a great. Um, yeah, I, you almost have to because I, I talk about this a little bit in my talk tomorrow, and it's something we've talked about. You probably need a couple of points of verification to really trust it. So, right. uh, maybe two directors or three director level folks in the company verifying over a million dollars, or and and have a, a process and a policy that, no matter how urgent or uh, important it is said to be by the quote unquote CEO in email, yeah. you don't violate the process. Right now, the flip side of that is it slows down your flexibility and slows down business when you build these unskippable or, or unavoidable process. Correct. And it's also, I, I also have to imagine it's uncomfortable for an employee, like, I mean, you know, let's say finance or accounting type employee to get an email from the CEO saying, look, you got to do this or you're going to get fired. And it's actually coming from the CEO's right. real account. Right. That authority that's a, figure is very powerful. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's tough. Um, but I would, I, say, think, I would say too part of the, the, the training you would probably need to do in there as well is training those executives that they aren't doing by matter of their actual business process what looks like the bad thing because I mean we've we've right. all seen this well yeah the M and A activity happens all the time and in those cases sometimes it's going to happen under the radar especially if it's a private company and at that point the owner or the CEO is going to send a note to the CFO saying you know we we need to get something moving on this we please keep this under your hat please wire this money blah 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 and that's actually a business business process so when you get something like this as the cfo it doesn't look wrong and it's really easy to sub- subvert all these different controls you put in place because that's exactly what happens if it's a legit request thanks john i, I kind of forgot you were here yeah that's okay <laughs> yeah. i'm here to well, remind you no it's, i'll be sitting it, up front to heckle you the entire it's a, time it's a, it's a good point and and i, I would i would uh I, I, kind of where i thought we were going and, and i'll i'll go there now is making sure that the CEO doesn't drive bad behavior, right? So, you know, if, if you build a process that says, you know, you're, you're, you have to have multiple, you know, d- different levels or different forms of authentication in order to, to handle that kind of transaction, and then the CEO actually, you know, storms down into the accounting office and says, God damn it, how come you didn't, you know, you're, you're, you're delaying this, you know, you, you, you that, that kind of perpetuates um, the, the vulnerability to this. Yes, there is a vulnerability and a high risk. Uh, this week I found out of a company that almost uh, wired $3 million. And this company has a security team, a top level security team. And so, yes, it can happen. And, um, and so you're right. So having two or three, uh, checkpoints or people verifying the amount after you know over a certain amount um, also reviewing the invoices uh, I'm doing some research so I can prepare presentations so that we can train our staff on what to look for in business email compromise this week I was reviewing an invoice for about fifteen hundred dollars and I was checking um, the website I was checking to see is the domain name um, valid uh, is the website built out if I call the 800 number not the number in the email or in the invoice. Is it, um, does someone pick up? Is there an operator? Is it recording? Do they have a directory? Um, I double check the rep. Um, so still, I would, I would imagine that for business email compromise, um, there are teams who have everything all built out already. I mean, they're thinking of all these things and really doing a deep, um, a deep background, a deep, check and making sure that everything is all set in case someone does that like like we did yeah and i think if we take it back to the basics to uh, hardening the ability for the bad guys to even get the account multi-factor off um not necessarily exposing those logins to the internet making them come in through some sort of vpn uh, monitoring where people are logging in from you know suddenly people are logging in from belarus and they're not supposed to triggering that right uh there's a lot of things we can do to keep them from getting in initially. But some of those things are a hassle, especially for executives. They may not want to deal with multi-factor authentication. We've got to convince them that it's worth the extra effort. Yeah. Or they may not want to deal with having to log into the VPN first to get to their email. They just want it on their phone all the time. So that's that's sometimes a, a cultural challenge. 
to to keep these things more more yeah. secure. Yeah, indeed, and I I think there's a there's a headwind running against us now with with a lot of the cloud based email. You know, there used to be uh, I I would say slightly higher hurdle that adversaries would have to get through. I mean, first they would have to get into your network in order to get to your email. Well, not, now that's not necessarily true. You know, if you're using, you know, Outlook 365 or, or Gmail or, or one of those other providers, which, by the way, is becoming more of the norm, you know, that this becomes a more complicated problem. Although I think we're seeing, um, you know, we're, we're starting to see movements from companies like Microsoft who are, who are, you know, trying to focus more on multi-factor authentication, and you know they're deprecating kind of the the, the traditional password, um, you know, to to hopefully negate some of that new risk that that we're uh, we're incurring by moving to the cloud. So, anyhow, um, moving on to the next story. This one comes from bleepingcomputer.com. The title is IC3. That, by the way, is the Internet Crime Complaint Center. Uh, issues alert regarding remote desktop protocol attacks. Uh, you know, this is... Um, it, Oddly enough, it doesn't much mention WordPress. It does not. It means actual RDP. It means actual RDP. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so... We, we've seen... Uh, I would say... I, I can't... I, I'm trying to remember the first time I actually... Saw this as a problem, and I, I, I mean, it kind of goes back as far as I can remember in my IT career. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> oh my. Um. <laughs> I think for IT departments, it's balancing um, control uh, versus comfort. I know for a lot of sysadmins, it's so convenient. It's great. You can RDP right from your workstation to the servers in the data center, whether they're physically on site somewhere or off site at a data center. Um, and uh, I, I can't, can't live without it. You know, I really need it. Um, so these types of, of attacks are a concern um, for, for us. And there's only so much that we can do because then it affects our ability to administrate the servers. Well, it's, it, it is a little... I think it's a it's a it's a nuanced problem because on the one hand, you know you've you've this typically is is a, an issue where you have exposed like, like RDP services exposed to the internet, and that happens for lots of different reasons. But is in general, you're right. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna administer uh, Windows servers in a lights out data center or a cloud environment, or whatever. You're going to use RDP. I mean, that's the way it works. Um, or, or you're going to do things to, you know, use use PowerShell commands across the network or whatnot. But you know, RDP is, I would say, certainly the most um, the most common way. But the, the the challenge is, as we've seen in a in a lot of cases, and I think there was just a a, a port in California. I forget the the name of the port was shut down as a result of a ransomware attack, um, which Again, I think it was. I think it may have been Sam. Sam. The the allegation was that it was the same thing that attacked um, or that that hit the city of Atlanta, which was Sam. Sam. And you know the common point of origin of all these things is open RDP. Right. And what's interesting from this story too is they're finding that a number of criminal marketplaces are populated with one. very inexpensive access to these. So as little as six dollars, and you can buy uh, uh, an RDP account on a target machine, and uh, you know get in. So clearly, there's a whole lot of folks who are leaving RDP exposed to the internet in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, and then it, not only that, they're they're leaving it exposed, and then there's some there's some other vulnerability. I mean, it's by itself doesn't offer access. You know, it has to be paired with. A weak password or you know, some some vulnerability or or what have you, but there's no net. You know, it's right. Like Shodan was able to index over two million computers running RDP that's directly open to the internet. Yeah, it, on the default port. Yeah, right. Which I gotta admit is really scary. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's probably not something we should be doing, especially because once you get that foothold, there's so many more things you can do. Right. Uh, I mean, that is... So for 5 to $10, I can get a foothold in some company. I mean, I can then go to town with whatever. Right. If I get RDB right. access, most and, likely. Yeah, and, and I mean, this is... <laughs> like, the sky's the limit, right? Once, yeah. Once you have that, that kind of access, the, the sky's the limit. I mean, obviously, you don't know what, what permissions... The, the account will have, but it's, I mean, there's, there's many, many, many elevation. If they're leaving RDP open to the internet, yeah, it probably tells me yeah, they don't have the best security hygiene as an organization in general. For, yeah, and there's probably two ways of looking at it too. They're probably, and I haven't you know dug into the numbers that are in the article, but there are the folks who set up the, like the equivalent of small business server, which, you know, is going to automatically open up RDP. And then there's folks who are setting up, and we'll go back to talking about cloud, mm-hmm. set up cloud services. And that could be potentially every single host they have out there. Like every sure. <laughs> every EC2 instance has just got, you know, is wide open because they didn't lock it down properly because they didn't know how to. And suddenly you have, you know, the one entry point where you get small business server or whatever else. And you have the entire infrastructure wide open via RDP. Right. And I, I think we see this a lot with um, with with some of the, I don't know what the right term is, the managed service providers for things like point of sale terminals gas pumps and many other things where you know they the, the the provider comes and drops the server at the gas station or at the store or what have you and plugs it into the internet and they use rdp um you know to connect to it i, I was in an office building recently and um the, the they had one of those kind of self checkout cafeteria things right it had a kiosk in the key- it was the kiosk was very clearly managed by RDP, you know, and and you know I don't I don't have any particular insight on whether that was a bad thing or or not, but in that in that case, but like I think this is a really common well, issue. RDP is an incredibly useful tool. Absolutely. So I think it's more a matter of using it wisely and securing it, you know, as opposed to just saying don't use it. I remember reading an article on Motherboard regarding a top voting machine vendor who admitted to installing remote access software on their machines well you know hey you gotta get, you gotta get in to, you gotta get the votes to, you gotta get in to manage it and, and get the votes off the machine and you know when when uh, when when it breaks or something like you don't want to have to dispatch a person to the site if you can just log in remotely and and you know do whatever is needed to fix it so uh, you know they they, they offer um, the DHS and US CERT offer some, uh, and, and the IC3 offer some recommendations, you know, things like um, moving RDP to a different port, but, you know, realistically, that's a that's of limited is, is that utility. Security? Well, it is, but at the same time, you can't, you can't easily get it by just running a Shodan query, right? So, I mean, it, it incrementally elevates... The complexity, but it doesn't change any of the fundamentals. Right. It's a very, very thin layer of the onion. Um, you know, they, not exposing RDP servers to the internet is probably the the, the most important recommendation they make. Um, but that's a hard thing to do, especially as as our environments become more and more federated out to different cloud providers, like you had said, and yeah, move into the quote unquote zero trust model. Right, we're going to have those sorts of things open. Right. Uh, so then it becomes about hardening them. Yeah. And so, so one of the one of the things that um, you know, and, and and by the way, I I I I kind of reject the notion that RDP in a zero trust model should be open to everywhere. You know, like I, I I know that there are some militant zero trust purists who think that you know there shouldn't we, we shouldn't rely on network type controls at all, and I'm not sure that's a winning strategy um you know but we got to find the right balance and one of the things that i've you know i i think is appropriate is to is to try to draw a box around your environment and then do your own shodan query right figure out for yourself you you should not have any of this stuff exposed to the internet right but you're not going to know if you're not scanning for it or, or do something like, you know, port knocking, where you do something that opens it up temporarily for the IP address you're coming uh, from. Yeah, that's you fine. Know, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of options there. Right, so. right. So it's not just wide open all day long for anybody to pound on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, they recommend using strong passwords and multi-factor authentication that hopefully is, you know, pretty 
apparent and obvious, uh, enabling account lockout policies. Um, you know, by, by the way, the one thing that, that I see, uh, actually I should say I don't see, which I really hope to see, is um, not only account lockouts, but being notified that an account has been locked out. Well, typically you know when you try to log in. I, <laughs> Here's the thing about account lockout policies. Um, you have to set it set it at a good number. So, for example, it should be three or five, but not 24, 50, yeah, well, or infinite. True. But I think... I think and, the, and have an auto timeout so it doesn't be used against you. Yeah, that, so that's the, that's the key right or, there. Is, or get clever and lock it to that IP. Yes. Depending on, on what your capabilities are. Correct. Because otherwise, you know, somebody could just keep you from accessing your own stuff by just... It's, a, it's an effective denial of service if you yeah. just... If you just like lock an account af- out after five tries, whatever, like you can go and lock out all the domain admins, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And, then, yes. and then go to yeah. go to town. Like that's that's not a great uh, that's not a great thing either. Um, the, you know, the one the one thing that seems to work pretty well, and I think it's native in Windows and some other operating systems, is you can kind of do this exponential, um, you know, time delay. You know, so after a couple of of failed logins it takes a while before you can try again and then if you fail again it takes even longer and so you don't you're not completely locked out um, but at the same time you are you know effectively blocking the brute force for all intents and purposes but the thing that that um that i think in general it departments and security departments don't really take advantage of is like when that happens you know alert on it right especially by the way if that's an internal system right and, you know like i i can't tell you how many times i've worked on an incident where you know in in the aftermath you look at the the forensic you know you look at the the what was happening on the system and it and accounts were just repeatedly being locked out because there was an adversary on the network you know trying trying to brute force and no one knew. No one paid attention because they weren't looking, and that's ridiculous. So, well, and the other thing I would say is, assuming we're not in a cloud environment, you know, organizations should be scanning from the internet their IP ranges to see what's open, so something doesn't sneak out there inadvertently because mistakes happen. Correct, absolutely. And you know, and by the way, you 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 touched on an interesting point. Um, cloud environments are difficult. Yeah. From from an IT inventory perspective, right? Because you don't know, you know, it's it's really easy to spin things up and shut things down. And we were talking about some of this stuff earlier. Like, you know, part of your strategy, like, just because it's in the cloud doesn't mean you don't need to know about it. You should know about it. And I think there's a, most all pro- cloud providers give you the tools you would need to know what IP addresses you're using at any given time and that should there there should be some kind of an automatic feed that lets you you know give you some awareness of that so you can feed that into your scanners or or what have you so use that stuff you know um they they talk about enabling audit records of of logins uh, which by the way is really important like if you're when your system gets compromised not only that but shuttle those logs somewhere else because I cannot tell you how many times we worked on an incident and the logs are gone because I mean what does the bad guy do once they get on a system delete the logs they delete the logs and how many companies and I, I I'm really getting worked up here do not move their logs off of the system and, and <laughs> it's infuriating Jerry's actually turning red. He actually yes. is. I, do you, I do you can want a second hug? that. I'm getting mad. I'm getting very Jerry, mad. Jerry, how do you feel about Active Directory? <laughs> and then install security <laughs> updates. Patch your crap. All right. Moving on to the last story. Okay. The logs um, are coming from inside the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the... the the, uh, the title here is Supply Chain Security is the Whole Enchilada, but who's willing to pay for it? This comes from Krebs on Security, and um, it, it's, a, it's a super long article about the recent, kind of what has been described by Krebs here is a bombshell report by Bloomberg that um, 
super micro motherboard server motherboards uh, I guess I don't know if it's all of them or or some of them though at least minimally the allegation is those used by Apple and Amazon for AWS had a a grain of rice sized uh, you know uh, microchip implanted on the motherboard and the in the allegation further is that this this um, microchip was intended uh, to to do a very very specific thing upon upon boot it was supposed to inject some code that told the kernel to go to an outside source to get some further instruction so it wasn't like it had its own you know massive amount of uh, of malware and whatnot but you know point was it was this persistent thing was baked into the motherboard that you couldn't get get rid of and the um now and, and it wasn't just super micro doing this it was being done by intelligence agencies supposedly correct because super micro's motherboards were made in china right and you know the it, it correct it wasn't wasn't that super micro was in, was doing it it was that it was being done to super micro motherboards and right off the bat let's let's also point out that everybody and their brother is denying this story correct so. correct so um there's uh, uh amazon notably has come out with a public statement and a blog post um basically saying that and and i think this was part of the story and there's a whole a lot of arms and legs to the story but part of the story apparently originated because Amazon bought a company who used mic- uh, super micro motherboards and so they they had allegedly engaged a third party hardware tester in Canada to take a look at these motherboards and so that's kind of where the story seems to diverge from like the the, the stories diverge from each other because the Bloomberg report basically says that the the testing agency or, or company identified this chip. And by the way, there's a there's like a there's a actually a picture picture running around the internet of a super micro motherboard with this chip on it, which by the way is not real. It's a it's a artist's rendering of what the motherboard would look like if the chip were there. And a lot of people seem to be confused that it's not actually real. Uh, so so that's <laughs> that's an important thing. Um, you see how these things take off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And by the way, it's Bloomberg, right? So right, it's not like a, it's a credible source in, in theory, and and they're doubling down after after the initial denials came out from Apple, Supermicro, and uh, Amazon. Bloomberg came out and said, "No, no, we stand by our story." Yes. Yeah, I mean Bloomberg has like an army of fact checkers, and right. so there's at least if nothing else, there's the assumption a lot of times if you see it in Bloomberg, it's likely true. Not to say maybe it was in this case, but I mean, Bloomberg doesn't play. Oh, I, I completely agree. That's that's been the position of a lot of certainly a lot of people that I've come in contact with. You know that they're they're making the assumption Bloomberg is knows what they're talking about. So I think you were going to didn't didn't Apple or Amazon divest a company in China because they thought that they these motherboards were compromised. That's part of the story. Yeah, I, I maybe so, but I hadn't. It, got there's to so that point. many weird things rolling around on this one. At the moment, it's kind of tough to know what's real, right, and what's alleged, right. So, so the I would net it out like this: um, Amazon says that they they in fact did engage a testing company to look at the at, at the product that used the super micro motherboard, and they did find some things. But none of them were related to like a chip. They said but their their characterization was you know anytime you send a device to a testing company like this, they find they find things that are suboptimal, some recommendations on on improvements, minor stuff, and and um, you know they they uh, Amazon claims that they kind of fed that back into the supply chain and they were all fixed and none of them were of the caliber that's being described here, but. Apparently, the Bloomberg sources appear to be intelligence agencies, and I kind of wonder, by the way, if possibly everybody's correct. Well, here's my thought. If this existed, why 
have these organizations not detected this rogue outbound communication to a CNC server? Well, so, uh, I, and I, I, I absolutely thought, I'm thinking on that same thought process, right. but but here's my, I guess here's kind of where I'm going, and I know this is complete hypothetical speculation, but, you know, we don't know, it, so, so, so the allegations from the Bloomberg story appear to come from unnamed uh, intelligence sources, right? And you know, we don't know who who they are or what they know or, or what have you, but it seems plausible, given what we saw, you know, four or five years ago with the Snowden leaks, right? That certain like Cisco routers and whatnot were being intercepted by the NSA, and they were putting in, you know impl- hardware implants into the in, into the devices. I mean, that concept could be playing out here, and so point is. Maybe there are some number of super micro motherboards that have been altered. The one, and, and that in general, that may, maybe they're not. I mean, I, I you know, it's it, it's it seems possible to me that both are true. Like that that the the system that Amazon sent to be tested in Cal, in Canada didn't have the microchip, and that maybe some of them actually do because they were being intercepted. Kind of like the NSA did by um, by you know Chinese or who, who the, the 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 Luxembourg uh, right intelligence service right. So why let's say for instance that this is real. And we'll just make that assumption, and that Apple and Amazon are aware. Maybe they've been notified. Maybe they have cooperated with investigators. Right. And perhaps the U.S. government has said, hey, keep it quiet. Or maybe not. Let's say they're not under a gag order or not under a denial order. Why do you think these organizations, if this was true, would be denying this? When we've already got a certain basis of plausible air cover under the concept of nation-state attacks like this are nearly impossible to stop. So they're not right. necessarily getting hit by a negative perception for getting hit by this. Yeah. So why deny it? Yeah, and you know, and, and that's one of the points that Krebs raises in his his post is that the the way in which Amazon and Apple denounced it or, or de- denied it, they they don't have any room to backtrack. You know, they like they like they anyway, that was his characterization. They can't. The way they the way they did it, they can't. There there doesn't appear to be any wiggle room in their in their denial, and I think you're absolutely on a good point. Like they could just say, you know what, you're right. Maybe it did happen, and you know we'll do we'll double down on our our supply chain security, or or you know what have what have you. But they're not doing that. Uh, yeah, it's almost like how can they prove the negative? How can they prove that this has never happened on any device that's ever come into the organization? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's a good point, right? And they yeah. can't, right? They. And again, I, I don't know if this is true or not. I don't know what to believe at this point. It's very uh, interesting to watch play out. I guess we'll have to, you know, see. I, I will tell you there's probably a whole lot of other people ripping apart their super micro supplies looking for uh, un, unannounced or unexpected uh, components on their motherboards. Right. Well, and that's uh, I, I, that's one thing I was thinking about is like, I haven't received oddly I haven't received a single email yet from a vendor in the past two days, which I was expecting. It's already been two days. I expect an email from a vendor saying, "Do you have anything from Super Micro? You should contact us to uh, you know to search our motherboards." <laughs> I mean, honestly, this is a cottage industry. That I mean, if there's an entrepreneur listening, seriously, three fifty an hour offer to, to call up every single company that you know and ask this question and just hit the news. So now everybody's panicking. But on the other side of it too, you know. Any of us who are doing anything in security, which is everyone who's listening, we're going to start getting these emails pretty soon or these, these letters from our, our partners and vendors asking to attest mm-hmm. whether or not we have super micro devices, right. whether or not Absolutely. we've had them checked out. And it's going to be it's a whole flurry of you know, or, or scary. They're, or they're going to add you know, a uh, new feature to our endpoint security suite to detect this no, sort I, of communication. I, I think what I think what John was mentioning is is a, is right on. You know, like with anytime there's a new Struts vulnerability or new, you know whatever, 
you, we get a flurry of, you know, usually from customers, right? Saying, you know, do you, have you, have you fixed struts everywhere? Oh, and, well, we also get a flurry from salespeople. Well, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. I know you get it. We get it from both ends, yeah. right? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I and, and by the way, when cu- when customers come asking about that, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, right. you, you know, you can say yes, I have super micro motherboards, and no, I don't. And if I don't, well, it's a very easy answer. But like, if you do, you know, you can't you can't lie. That's unethical. And and you know. What do you do? Like you pull out that crappy, um, you know, faux picture that was edited and go look at, you know, open up all your servers and say, oh, nope, that doesn't have the grain of rice. Nope, that one doesn't have it either. What, what do you do? What about insurance companies who add a rider asking, oh, do you have this list of products on your network? And if you do, it's an extra X yeah, amount of dollars. Right. <laughs> I don't know if that happens or not, but that you're, you're right. That would be interesting so circling back slightly just to be clear when we're talking apple we're not just talking like uh, their products we're talking their internal it infrastructure yeah like the stuff that i, I mean i'm assuming right that I'm, I'm assuming it's the stuff that like maybe runs itunes or icloud or or you know, kind of the yeah, back end stuff or or maybe hey maybe it's their financial system and we we don't really know but not like iphones and ipads and correct it's home speakers Correct. I don't know. I don't think because Super Micro has motherboards Siri. inside your iPad. Yes, yeah, but you know that oh, changes. Oh, yeah, well, Siri, right? Absolutely. You know, if think about this for a moment. If it was getting into IoT devices or, or home devices, now we're taking away from the concept of a of a bastion of a network security environment that may be able to stop or spot this sort of ex, exfiltration data. It's on my phone. I'm certainly not going to know that. Right. Uh, which you know, I'm not suggesting that's what this story is about. But it's interesting to think, what if it migrated to that level? Uh, and it's a whole different set of nightmares. Yeah, I, I blame John for. <laughs> well, that's what I do. Mm-hmm. I, I would expect anybody who works in a company that has or has, that, that currently does or has done any sort of government contracts is going to have a bad couple months because the folks are going to be asking like crazy from inside and from the outside. And I, I feel bad because you know, like you said, I. Would I know exactly the grain of, of rice I'm looking for? Am I trained to to find that exact thing? <laughs> and is this real? Right. Or am I wasting a lot of cycles on it, exactly. a misunderstood situation? Exactly. We, we don't know that it's real. And that's one thing that drives me insane about this is, you know, you... We, well, I think, for good or ill, now that this has gone public, if it's real, I think there's a high likelihood third parties independently will verify this to get a name for themselves. Yeah, I this think This is you're too right. popular. I think you're a, right. There's too much publicity around there for a third party not to come out and say, oh, by the way, we found it. Would you like to hire our services? Uh, so, I don't know. Part of me says if this isn't independently verified within the next 30 days, it's less likely to be real. Re- yeah, regardless of, and I agree with completely with that point, but regardless... We know what's going to be at DEF CON and Black Hat next year. There's going to be proof of concepts of people soldering crappy, you know, Raspberry Pi stuff to server motherboards. To, you know. Isn't what the ILO port is? <laughs> no. <laughs> the same thing? No, no, I, I mean, <laughs> people are going to try to make that real. You know, they're, they're going to, they're like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's see how we can actually go do that. It probably won't be a grain of sand or grain of rice size thing, but. You know, look, we're going to see it next year. And by the way, I just gave a lot of people a research idea. So, you know, this is put put that put and John's guy. business idea. That's the kind of value we provide on this podcast. That's right. Someone's going to get rich on this. <laughs> for the record, John does not speak for the podcast, the owners of the podcast, <laughs> Jerry, Jerry's the, dog, the me. affiliates of the podcast, the uh, llamas, the, llamas, yes, any, any llama anywhere or the def, def sex stadium. Any right. Anyone who's ever donated to the podcast. Uh, or any, Patreon. Uh, right, right. right, right. Uh, uh, or, or or anyone alive today. Really, yeah. we're just going to see. Or, or any of the ISPs that carry network traffic. So Anywhere. So yep. don't sue us for John's <laughs> utterings. Man, I come, I come out here once and I stink up the place. Man. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to have to tell you like this. <laughs> All right. For, for the record, I've known John a about 74 years. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pretty excited. It's, it's all good nature. Probably, we, 
probably only 73. Sure. We've already we've already established I don't look you know a day over 94, and I'm pretty proud of that. He does lots of tai chi. Lots of yeah. tai chi. Yeah. <laughs> Well, one last point I did want to make um, about no. the that. Okay, no. okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, John. Well, just going back to the thing that you said and uh, earlier, Andy, is the other the, the the thing that has not been said so far, and maybe it was in the article because I only made it through part of it, um, is way to prep. I know, right? Yeah. Well, I didn't know until five minutes before this I was gonna you know have a mic in front of my face, um, but like way to prep, Jerry. <laughs> Okay. Podcast well, I, I, well, at least I saw you reading the articles for once. So thanks, it. Andy, for, for showing up. <laughs> I own that one. <laughs> what I was going to say, though, is that I, what, what hasn't been said yet is, like, what motherboard is not made in China at this point? And everyone's pointing out Super Micro. But really, oh, great the point. question is, like, what what hardware coming out of China, which is every single piece of hardware, doesn't have potentially something like this? Correct. Yeah, and by the way, I've, see, I've seen... Um, Seen a growing backlash against Lenovo. You know, well, that, they did that, to themselves. Uh, well, that happened right when I even sold them. Right. There, no, there was, I mean, it, there's a there's a been within the, like the last six months. No, no, yeah, renewed, I, I, I agree, uh, yeah. renewed. But I remember when IBM uh, spun off ThinkPad. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that everyone's absolutely. like, no, they're Chinese spies. Right. Don't buy them. Right, and they're made in the same place. Right. <laughs> Pretty much, I think. I, I mean, I don't know for sure. Um, but yeah, that 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 is a, that's a it's a good point. And by the way, I um I, I can't remember where I read it, but the, you know one of the one of the points was if if a if for instance the Chinese government wanted to do something like this, it would be far more effective to actually bake those implants into the silicone of a of a microchip of a Jerry, microprocessor. Why, why are you giving them hints? I don't know. You know the entire senior leadership of the Chinese military listens to this <laughs> That's podcast. True. Jerry, who do you work for? You know, that's a very good question. Who's that weird Asian man staying at the house? <laughs> oh, <God>. Suddenly <laughs> the podcast got very racist. Jerry, Jerry's son Jason does not speak for the podcast, <laughs> its sponsors. Or for John. <laughs> <laughs> My dog. Yes. All right. Well. You know, you uh, or for Carolina, <laughs> right? <laughs> or for my dog. <laughs> but I think this is a, an interesting boogeyman, right? Yes. This is some witchcraft type level stuff that is really tough to disprove once exactly. this thought process is out there. Exactly. Uh, and you know, you could take it to the next step of how do we know Intel or AMD or whomever doesn't sneak some stuff into the dyes of their main CPUs. So I see another potential business certificates, manufacturing certificates. It's guaranteed that it was made at a particular place following the blueprints with change Ooh, orders. Blockchain. blockchain. I was blockchain. the same thing. <laughs> what? What's blockchain? <laughs> it's going to save the world. That's what it's going to do. <laughs> when is the ICO? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting point. I think there are some certifications already, but still. But you still have to trust. Yeah, right. I mean, the problem vendor. is these these like computers, especially like this the, the system on a chip type thing that you have uh, in, in your in your phone and your iPad. And now, are we talking I, ruffles? Are we talking tortilla chip? I like the the uh, ruffles. <laughs> For those who don't know, <laughs> this is my lovely wife, Emily. Who's sitting next to me? Who never even got a chance to speak. Would you? Would you like to say hello? Hi, y'all. There you go. That is not her accent, but she's an actor, so apparently she's from now South Carolina. There you go. Or Savannah, a good Southern girl. Anyway, sorry, completely we, off topic. We've, we've lost this. Whole so system episode. on a chip. Yes, yeah, system ruffles. on a chip. Um, you know, the, the, even even like x86 and 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 chipsets on motherboards. I mean, these things have. You know, hundreds of millions, sometimes multiple billions, tens of billions of, of transistors, they are ungodly complex. And, um, you know, it is it is not out of the realm of possibility to, you know, to, to design them in, like, you know, kind of post-design pre-manufacture of the microprocessor. It's not out of the realm of possibility, you know, if you have... 
you have a, a sufficiently advanced adversary. But like, but your point is, and I agree with this, like we can we can keep creating boogeymen, right? We can we can keep playing this out and and boogie women to the well. Okay, fair enough. Boogie people. All right, I, I, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to offend you anyone. Should there. be. Didn't mean to offend anyone. Boogie people. Um, seems seems a little weird. To yeah, me, at but, some point you gotta you gotta trust something, or you drive yourself crazy. Right, or you're back to edge of sketches. Right. Or or you know, thirty two seventy terminals connected yeah. to a mainframe you coded and built I'm yourself. Just, all I'm saying is we didn't have phishing problems and drive by. Malware infections when we were on green screen. I'm just going to leave that there. Okay. That's true. On the ENIAC. Good idea. Let's what, go back to ENIAC? AS400. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We are old. <laughs> so, anyway, that is the show for this week. Mercifully, Did, we're going to end it here. Well, you know, one really quick thing. Oh, yeah. Go we, ahead. We never asked you your impressions and thoughts of Derecon when you were asking everybody else, putting everybody else on the spot. Um, like the mean, mean old man. Well, so so, so <laughs> my my thought is a um, couple things. One is okay. That, so that's the show. Thanks yeah. everybody for listening. Wow, what a jerk! <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. You can edit that out. No, I'm going to leave that in so people know what I have to work with here. Oh, I think, I think they know. Um, so, so I. I you know, I like I said earlier. I think um, I think it's it's heavily heavily red team. And by the way, I you know I'm not opposed, and I'm actually a big supporter of blue team people being exposed to uh, to red team tactics. I actually think that's a really important uh, concept. You know, because if you don't understand, I mean, I look, I I, got, I can't tell you how many times I've worked on. Breaches where the you know the the IT administration and the architects and the design people had no idea. Like you know when 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 I'm explaining what happened, like how, they had no conception that that could happen. That it's those witchcraft. Tech, yeah, right. It is witchcraft, but it's not. And and so you, you don't get that perspective until you really understand um, the types of techniques that adversaries are using. And so I think that's valuable. But there's not a lot of solutions, you know. It's like the the one the one problem, and I think we talked about this in years past. Like you come into this conference and you got a hundred problems, and you leave and you got a hundred twenty problems. And Trevor ate one. And Trevor ate yeah. one. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Oh. R.I.P. My boy Trevor. Um, so so that's one. Um. I think it is becoming it, it, the the demographics of the conference are much different. I mean, not not necessarily visually different, but like I'm just seeing lots of people that I've never seen before, which is which is good. Um, um, I, I think the new venue is is quite nice. Um, it's a little more open and and airy, and things are spread out a little more. And there's there's actually room for for more things. Like there's the the well the mine. Um, the mental wellness thing, which is really cool. That that's uh, Amanda. Shout out to Amanda Berlin for yeah. spinning that up. Yeah, it was really really. Oh, cool. I was the name dropper. <laughs> well, Kanye told me to kind of cut it back. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, you know, they they had the car hacking village, uh, hardware hacking village, uh, the SC village, village. SC village. Um, two different CT, a couple different CTFs. They had the the the. the uh, IOT CTF and then uh, um, the actual SC CTF and then the the normal uh, kind of technical CTF and Vanilla Ice and Vanilla Ice and the Offspring and we invited Vanilla Ice on the show. Uh, he never replied. Yeah, he he said he had something to do. He had, to, house to, he had to wash his other. cat or something. It was weird. I don't know. Um. <laughs> Okay, we get it. We're, we're completely off the rails. Yeah. So anyway, um, thanks everyone for listening, and thank you to everyone here for uh, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate the the ask. Absolutely. So my talk, which I'll be giving tomorrow, should end up on YouTube. Uh, Iron Geek is doing all the recording. So if you're interested, check it out. 
Uh, hopefully by the next show, I'll have a link we can put in the show notes, but I don't know where it will be yet. A lot of the talks have, uh, from yesterday are already online. Yeah. So, yeah. so probably by, by the time you're on the plane, or by sort of driving home, they'll probably be so d- up there d- Depending already. on when, when, this, when I have a chance to release this, I will... Um, if I can, I will include it in the show notes when I release it. If I can't, I'll add it to the show notes afterwards on the website. So I can't go back and edit the MP3 file that you already downloaded because that would be creepy. Uh, but it would be cool if Supposedly I could. Supposedly we can't. Supposedly. Yeah, there's that chip that I... <laughs> there's that one chip we implanted, right? Yeah. Anyhow, thanks, thanks everyone. We'll talk again soon. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.